Welcome to the Skullworld Forum on Social Entrepreneurship, coming to you from Oxford, England. I'm going to be talking to a US doctor turned global health pioneer in Rwanda, turned Oxford academic. And we also want to hear from you. If you want to forward us questions, we'll integrate them in the conversation. So I'm honoured to have with me today, now, Peter Drobak. You trained and worked as a medical doctor in the US. You then went to Rwanda, became executive director of Partners in Health, and you also co-founded a university, the Global Health Equity in Rwanda. You now direct the Skoll Center of Social Entrepreneurship here in Oxford Said's Business School, where you oversee and many, many programs bringing social change from MBA degrees, research and partnerships. And you draw upon your previous life's work working in remote rural areas in Rwanda, amongst others. And I also hear you do a bit of pottery because we have a challenge today. We are going to be using these slightly messy watercolor paints to paint a very critical question, something that you are working on hard, which is systems change, a whole revolution in the way that we are thinking about society in order to create more effective ways of looking at society and changing it. So we're going to be drawing that out to try and unpick some of the concepts around that. So we'll see where we go. <laughs> if you've seen some of my pottery, you probably would have put the pens away. <laughs> no, that's no, okay. no, we'll try. it's going to be good. And we've got to do it so it faces <laughs> the camera so our uh -huh. viewers on Facebook Live can enjoy it too. But you've now been uh, as a head or leader, director of the Skull Center for Social Entrepreneurship for over a year. Uh -huh. But tell me, what for you is the most important thing? What are you trying to achieve there? Well, first, let's talk about what social entrepreneurship is. Um, at its core, it's just about using the tools of entrepreneurship, creativity, innovation, grit, creation, um, and market-based approaches to make the world a little bit better, to try to tackle tough, complex social or environmental problems. And it's something that I was doing in my work in global health for many years without knowing it necessarily. Um, but ultimately, it is an approach, not a business model. You can be a social entrepreneur working in a not-for-profit or a for-profit or working in government. You can do it as a founder or as an entrepreneur. It's a way of making change. Um, and, but it's and solving change some for of the really social impact. It's not just any change. That's right. Well, positive change, hopefully, right? There's a lot of negative impact that happens when we don't pay attention, um, but trying to tackle some of the world's most pressing problems. You know, I've spent my life trying to um, improve access to um, modern medical care and health care um, for the world's poorest, which I you know, see as a, as a human right. And, um, and ultimately, you're trying to actually shift the system that excludes people in the first place. Um, so I believe and we believe at the Skoll Center that social entrepreneurship is a really, pos is a really powerful force for positive social change, particularly in an era when we, you know, in an era of loss of trust in government and big institutions and the seeming paralysis in many of our government leaders to really get anything done. Um, we need solutions to come from other places uh, and social entrepreneurship is a part of that. Um, so our goal is to help to grow and mainstream social entrepreneurship as a thing and as a field and as a movement and a way for people to make positive change in the world. And you're not just interested in sort of individual uh, changes in a small scale. You're looking for big systems change. Maybe we can kind of draw that and as we paint that you can describe what it is and what we need to do to get there. So I've just sure. been thinking maybe because it's a kind of so radical change we can have uh, oops, somebody who is here this way round uh -huh. and um, there we go. It's quite hard to draw somebody uh, at an angle but we will pursue this and you are looking to uh, create this radical an improved version uh, in a, uh, uh, kind, of, kind of a whole radical t turnaround of perspectives here. Yeah. So if this is systems change, uh, what do we need to do to create it? And maybe you can draw it as you talk it. Here you go. All right. Well, let me, let me, let me think about it. One analogy first, just to take from medicine, you know, the way that we're trained as doctors is to look at the human body as a system, right? And it's a system that needs to work in some kind of equilibrium in order to function well in disease and alteration of that system. Um, so when I'm sick, I might get a fever. Um, and you might treat that fever with paracetamol. Ultimately, you're only treating the symptoms, you're not treating the root cause of what's causing the problem in the first place, and you're not going to have a good effect. Um, and so if we think about um, medicine as treating the system, take that same analogy and apply it to any other problem. We think about systems change, we're thinking at 
how to understand and explore and get at the root causes of a problem. That's why people are excluded from access to healthcare or education, um, to uh, why we're spewing so much carbon dioxide into the environment and destroying our planet. And by understanding those root causes, that's where we want to get to so and what, sort of make the changes and the fixes. So your academics and the MBA students and PhD mm -hmm. students who are working in the Skoll Center, they're trying to understand the mechanisms by which change in one place will impact upon change somewhere else. Exactly. And ultimately, like any system, there's some complexity. There's a lot of different pieces or different actors that are all interdependent. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, change here can create some kind of effect over there, which could be positive or negative. You know that game, Whack-A-Mole, where you hit down on one and then another one pops up somewhere else? Um, that's what makes the work rich, but also really complex. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so to be effective, you have to understand all the different actors in the system and how the pieces kind of fit together and, and understand where you can make change. And sometimes though, because of the degree of complexity, do some of your students ever get frustrated and feel that it's so complicated that they can't do anything and they just want to get on and create action somewhere without having to do loads of research, which can sort of take years to come to a true understanding of such a complex system. Absolutely. It's not the way that we're really trained to think or to solve problems. Usually to solve a problem, you're taught to break it down into small steps and approach it in a very linear fashion. Um, and that doesn't account for kind of the messiness of thinking about a system. There's, there's ambiguity, there's uncertainty about what's actually going to happen two steps down the road. Can we that talk can about a practical example? Because we're talking uh -huh. very theoretical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Audiences might be interested to know about what actually it means when you're talking about a student who wants to do a research project. Uh -huh. Tell me about it. Well, one example I could give and you. And you're welcome to draw. I notice you haven't yet done I haven't any drawing. Yet drawn. I'm not but trying you need, to avoid it. Okay. No, you do need to put uh -huh. some marker on this I paper. These people are very interesting. I don't know what sort of hat, <laughs> hat you've given them. That's nice. Um, uh, so well, let me just give you an example okay. of system change and how we might approach it. So, so I sort of came of age in my medical training. And the reason I went to medical school um, came from um, some experience that I had while working in East Africa in the late 1990s when the AIDS epidemic was at its peak. And I was working with, um, with, with kids who were living on the street, almost all of whom had been orphaned by um, the AIDS pandemic. And that was a time when effective treatments had come into existence on the cover of Time Magazine and Newsweek. There were covers like The End of of AIDS and then meanwhile all around me people were dying and nobody was even thinking about or talking about the possibility that these human beings deserve access to this life-saving treatment that existed because at the time it was expensive right it was fifteen thousand dollars per person per year and here we're talking about a country where the um, the gross domestic product per capita is a hundred or two hundred dollars per year and ultimately that's sort of why I got into it and what happened between then and the late 1990s and about six years later was that we shifted into a world in which um, quite suddenly it seemed everyone agreed that um, everyone that that everybody with HIV deserves a shot at this life-saving treatment. So what had to happen to get from this place where we accepted AIDS as a death sentence for most faraway poor people to one in which um, suddenly we, we think everyone deserves a shot at treatment and we're actually gonna make it happen. The first was the work of social entrepreneurs, folks who would actually disrupt the status quo and and demonstrate a model for change. So that was organizations like Partners in Health who were treating HIV in the poorest parts of the world, for example, in rural Haiti. So is that a mind shift, though, that, as you said earlier, it was understanding, really accepting the fact that vast numbers of people were having to live life with HIV or AIDS to saying, no, we've got this drug, it is existence, it is being used for some wealthy patients in the West, let's democratize it. It starts with that, refusing to accept the status quo, which you view as unjust, right? If I view healthcare as a human right, and the person in front of me, I would want to give the same care that I would to my own family member if I could, you can't accept that. Um, it doesn't mean the answers are easy, but once you start with that premise um, that this isn't gonna work and we need to find a way, you muddle through, and that meant sometimes begging borrowing and stealing drugs in the early days, but ultimately in doing that and showing that you can do it in a place with very limited resources and low levels of education and all other kinds of things, suddenly the arguments for inaction ring really hollow, right? And so those models for change kind of combat the failures of imagination, and that's the first step. Mm -hmm. But then beyond that, there had to be 
policy change, there had to be shifts in market. So you can say, why do the drugs cost $15,000 per year? How can we bring that cost down dramatically? There had to be new financing, and so that requires political will and policy change and creative new market forces. All of those were different elements of changing the system, which ultimately has saved tens of millions of lives. And, um, and that's one of the most, I think, um, powerful examples of systems change, at least in my lifetime. And what we're interested in doing is understanding at the beginning, at the outset of a problem that you want to tackle, how do you approach it? How do you get from here to here? And that's what the sort of systems change idea is all about. So if I was a student doing an MBA at Said Business School, mm -hmm. at the Skoll Center for Social Entrepreneurship, and I was interested, for example, in looking at early childhood education, uh -huh. and I thought that there was an area where there's undoubtedly a big need. We know that if you have early childhood education, for girls, for example, uh -huh. but for all kids, it can make a dramatic uh, impact on, that's at least my understanding of the research. Yeah. So what would how would your systems change make me as a student at your institution think differently? Yeah, so the first step is often to apprentice with the problem, right? We, uh, particularly in business schools, have this real solutions focus that, um, that leads us to tend to try to jump towards a game-changing solution. And if you um, spend all your time on the solution and none of your time trying to understand the problem in the system and who it affects and how it affects them, um, you're often going to come up short. And so apprenticing with the problem means understanding the problem deeply, not just the technical and academic aspects to early childhood education, but getting some real on the ground experience, learning from children, from teachers, from caregivers, from stakeholders, understanding the whole context, um, because oftentimes the solution may not be um, in the sector you want. You know, earlier off camera we were talking about obesity, which people think of as a health problem, um, but the real way to tackle obesity is nothing that you can do in a clinic. It's what happens outside in supermarkets and in food systems and in terms of lifestyle, in terms of how we get around and get to and from to to and from work, all of those are aspects of combating obesity. And so if you go in with a narrow focus of this mm -hmm. is a big health problem, I need to invent a new drug for obesity, you're gonna get the solution wrong. Um, so that time apprenticing with the problem and mapping the system and quite literally actually drawing a map of all the different actors in a system. Yes, yeah, so go on. Um, so you may, oh, I've drawn upside down here. So I'm gonna draw a little girl here. I'm really bad at this, sorry. It's okay, I, I'll help, I'll, uh -huh. I'll, I'll give her a dress. Well, she doesn't have to have a dress if she's a girl, but she might yeah. choose one. Okay, so you've got, this is the person who we want to be the client, yeah. who we want to be working exactly. towards. Exactly, sort of at the center of your, of, of your issue. And then what you can do is then map out all of the other actors or stakeholders um, in that relationship. That could be, um, you know, that could be immediate family, that could be church, that could be schools, um, and uh, that could be government entities responsible for education, and so on and so forth. And then you start to map out what are the interdependencies between all of these different, um, all these different actors and kind of what's their roles. That's one way of kind of, of, of doing a systems map. So oftentimes it just starts with a big whiteboard and, and, and looking at this visually to understand and then this early step in just stakeholder mapping helps you understand well who needs to be at the table as we explore this right mm -hmm. um, because when you do all your research from <laughs> say Google um, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna mess up um, and so well, this big, helps you understand to... who needs to be in the conversation who needs mm -hmm. to be at the table who's got a stake in this um, and who can contribute ideas and become part of the solution so there's an element of sort of both top-down and, and bottom-up thinking and bringing those things together um, which is a really important part of thinking about you know systemic change and do you find how many of the uh, young people who, not only young people, but probably mainly young people who are doing MBAs at Said Business School, how many of them are interested in social entrepreneurship in your very broad definition? In a very broad definition, the answer would be the majority. Um, and, and it may be a little bit higher at Said Business School than some other business schools. But to be honest, the world is changing. I think rising generations now that are um, coming into their careers and doing MBAs are looking at trying to build careers with meaning and purpose. And that yeah. means making a difference in the world. So probably- Is there evidence for this? Because people often talk about the fact uh -huh. that young people are more keen on purpose, yeah. in, not just in business schools, but uh -huh. all across the world. Yeah. Do you understand you know about evidence for this? So there has been some evidence. There have been surveys of prospective MBA students. It was done by 
Um, one of the big one of the big consulting firms, mm -hmm. I can't remember which, but it was a um, it was an international survey, and they found that about eighty percent of incoming MBA students um, stated that they wanted a career with purpose, mm -hmm. um, and ranked that as a more important motivator more important motivator to them than money. Wow, eighty percent. Not to say money wasn't important, mm -hmm. but that this is also something that ranks up there for me. And so amongst those, some are going to be people who are really strongly committed, who they want to be change makers in the world, that they want to be social entrepreneurs. A lot of them just want a, a, a career that's more than money and need to understand what that could look like mm -hmm. um, and how I can make a difference in the world and how I can do that through a career in business or in other sectors. Um, and so that's an important part of the journey and I think part of where business education really needs to evolve because it's not, you know, we're not in the days of Gordon Gecko anymore when it's all just about making money, mm -hmm. thankfully. That's fascinating. Yeah. Although it must feel sometimes you're here in Oxford, surrounded by well, Ashmolean Museum opposite and a nice statue and uh -huh. all these dreaming spires. And it's quite far from rural Rwanda, where you spent a lot of time just prior to coming here. Yeah. Um, so one of the critical lessons about not only the systemic change work, but just social change work in general, is that proximity to the problem and to the people affected by the problem is one of the most important things. And that's why during all those years I was working in global health in Rwanda, I was living not even in the capital city of Kigali, but in a rural remote village at the heart of where our work was, because it meant walking to and from work every day and being part of a community that were the folks that we were trying to, um, uh, you know, to help. Uh, was really important because you, you're embedded in the social context and the mm. political context and all of these other things that can affect what you do. Um, so what we often encourage our students to do is um, is to work on a problem that you have some proximity to. That could mean, you know, because we have students who come from everywhere. There are 62 countries represented in our MBA program this year. Wow. Um, uh, so wherever you come from, if there's a problem back home that you're deeply concerned with, you already have networks there that you can sort of tap into for it. Mm -hmm. If not, maybe don't try to solve a problem halfway around the world in a place you've never been. Um, there are, you know, there are social problems everywhere. Right here mm -hmm. in Oxford, homelessness mm -hmm. is a massive and urgent and pressing invisible issue mm -hmm. let's um, think about service in our own community and being part of the solution here um, and then you learn by doing and do you feel that there's that you're having success in enabling that transformation in thinking I think we're getting there. I think we're getting there. Um, absolutely, we um, we have a, a, a part of the core um, MBA curriculum now that's called Global Opportunities and Threats Oxford, or Go To for short. And that's a course that's about systems leadership and thinking about sustainability and addressing the sustainable development goals as a systems leader. And it sort of turns the whole notion of business education upside down a little mm -hmm. bit because um, you, you got your upside down people. There you go. Um, and it, it tries to address these complex problems in a new way. Um, it's, a, it's a new way of thinking, and, and we may have to really think about, um, to me, leadership in the 21st century in a world where, um, where we're talking about distributed networks and not hierarchies and power and authority and leadership doesn't come from just being able to delegate and having direct power. It comes from influence. It comes from being able to build coalitions. It comes from being able to inspire others and motivate collective action. Um, that requires a new way of thinking, a new way of working, and a new way of education. So we hope that this is the beginning of kind of reimagining that. And what's now keeping you up at, uh, at night? What are you, the big challenges that are worrying you that you want to be addressing next? Yeah. So for the center in general, um, our approach has been that we're issue agnostic. We're about creating platforms and tools for people to address the issues they care about most. So we don't have specific issue areas um, that we've historically focused mm -hmm. on. Um, and our students and other members of our network are working on just about every problem imaginable in every place. Um, if I had to choose, though, it's hard not to talk about the thing that I actually do lose sleep over, which is which is climate change. Um, things mm -hmm. having become as bad as they've become, and you know the um, the, the, the sort of new views and data that have come out since the IPCC report last year. International panel, panel on, on in, intergovernmental panel mm -hmm. on climate change. Mm -hmm. So the most recent report, which was published late in 2018, yeah. suggests that actually the problem is much worse than we thought it was. Um, we used to think that if the global average temperature increased by two degrees from, from where it was, um, that we'd be cooked. Um, in, term, in fact, it's going to be less than that. And we've got less than 12 years now to make a substantial 
turnaround in how much carbon dioxide we're emitting or the effects become irreversible. And we're already seeing, particularly in parts of the world where I've spent a lot of time and really care about, like Rwanda and Sub-Saharan Africa, um, that the people who are most vulnerable are the most affected by this. So this is something we can't sleep on. Brilliant. Thank you. That really fascinating stuff. Yeah. I envy your students who are learning so much and thinking so creatively and full of system change and making their world turn upside down in a good way. Thank you very much indeed, Peter Droback. Well, join me in 20 minutes to hear Pat Mitchell on Dangerous Women.